I was browsing through the Edinburgh Fringe programme this year and I came across Abolish Childhood, a lecture. And it caught my eye. I thought, Abolish Childhood? That's so ridiculous. That has to be from an academic. So I read the little write-up. This is what it said. Childhood is an injustice. Childhood infantilizes, exploits and oppresses children. Dr. Philip Cook, University of Edinburgh, argues that justice demands we abolish childhood. But how can we abolish childhood? And would abolishing childhood harm children? Philip explains how society creates childhood through its laws. These laws aim to protect children, but they end up disempowering them. Children should be treated as equals, entitled to make their own choices about their lives. Treating children as equals might seem shocking, but abolishing childhood is the best thing we can do if we truly care about our children. Now that sounded to me like a completely crazy idea, but the thing is, you need to look at these things because crazy ideas that float around in universities, give it five years time and they'll be debating it in the Scottish Parliament and it'll be being enacted in laws. Sometimes it's a good idea to look upstream to see what's floating down towards you. Now I've come across this idea of childhood as being an invention before. The Museum of Childhood in Edinburgh on the Royal Mile, they've got a display uh, that's quite new actually, and that says that childhood was invented by the Victorians. Invented by the Victorians. What did they think happened before then? I mean, did babies transmogrify into 19 year olds in an instant? But of course, it's the fashion in academia to say everything is a social construct. It's not an objective reality, it's just a conceptualization formed by a particular society. So social constructs could be gender, race, illness, family, technology, age, you name it. There's probably an academic somewhere trying to claim that it's a social construct. And with a lot of them, the basic idea is that they were invented by the patriarchal, colonial, sexually repressed Christian Victorians. And since the 1960s, we've been escaping from them. And that's the direction we have to keep going in. So off I went to the Banshee Labyrinth, or a dingy little room. There are only a few people there, maybe 15. And all of them apart from me were just sitting there nodding away and they didn't show any sign of disturbance no matter how radical the things they said. They just let it wash over them with no flicker of objection from anyone. So Dr. Cook started explaining what it's all about. In the same way that there'd been a fight for racial equality, there'd been a fight for women's liberation, there'd been a fight for LGBT rights, various oppressed groups that had to fight for their rights against the oppressors. But it really sounded like a fairly Marxist interpretation of the world with the equality obsession. Anyway, so we now look at children. Are children treated like adults? No, they're treated differently. That's an inequality. Inequalities are bad, so we need to treat them the same. Now, some people use this sort of liberationist uh, ideology just as rhetoric. For example, people promoting the smacking ban in Scotland, they say equal protection for children and adults should be treated the same. They don't really mean children and adults should be treated the same in every way. They're just using it as a little rhetorical trick that anyone with any sense can see through. But some people actually do believe it. They actually do think that children's liberation involves treating them exactly the same as adults. So Dr. Cook got onto the first of his three points. Schools should be optional. Kids shouldn't be made to go to school. They can choose to go if they want to. Then when they're there, they can choose whether to go to lessons or what lessons to go to or what to do. And obviously he cited as an example of this Summerhill School. Summerhill is an experimental school in the south of England, started in the 1920s. And they operate on this principle. But the big problem is that children and young people often can't distinguish between their desires and their best interests. What they desire to do for the short term might not be in their best interests in the long term. And because children and younger people are not very good at making that distinction or recognize it or acting on what is generally the best interest, then adults make the decisions for them uh, in terms of education in particular. But he disagrees with that. Now, the founder of Summerhill School was A.S. Neil. He was actually a Scottish fellow. We're going to see a bit of him in a minute. I read his book a few years ago. He talked about sitting in his study reading the newspaper. And one of the girls at the school sneaked in with some matches and set the newspaper on fire while he was reading it. And his response was to congratulate her on showing such spirit. And Summerhill School had a, a sort of committee, a school parliament type idea that makes the rules. And once in the meeting, some of the pupils complained that two members of staff were playing tennis naked on the school tennis courts. 
So the pupils voted that that wasn't allowed and then therefore they were stopped. But anyway, here's the man himself. Let's see what he's got to say. Lying uh, shouldn't come in. If a child lies to you and you parents, uh, there's something wrong with you. I wrote in one of my books, there isn't such a thing as a problem child, there's only a problem parent. And another thing I object to in, uh, with grown-ups and parents is obedience. I don't think there should be obedience. If, if you have obedience, you should have a, a mutual obedience. I never ask a child to obey me, and the child doesn't ask me to obey him. Why should they? We exploit children, really. We shouldn't do it. Yeah. So how's Summerhill getting along today? Actually, A.S. Neal's daughter is now the headmistress. This is what she's got to say. Summerhill often now finds itself in a disciplinary role because many children today don't have boundaries set in their homes. It's a far cry for the day, days when, as she put it, my father was breaking windows with them to show that adults weren't to be feared. And I feel that's a case of reaping what you sow. Summerhill contributed hugely to the breakdown of authority uh, in schools and undermining the concept of obedience. And now that's been undermined in society, they're facing the problems within the school. So how did A.S. Neal's philosophy work out within his own family? Well, at 12, his daughter became involved with a group of troublemakers at Summerhill who were never going to lessons. I thought that was okay. Uh, smoking, swearing, breaking bedtime laws, stealing. So she was sent to a different school in Switzerland. And she's now the headmistress of the school. So if kids can just opt out of school, who's going to look after them? If they just get up one day and say, no, I don't feel like going today. What are the parents supposed to do? How's the school supposed to function? if there can't be any fixed timetable for every, anyone. Are the kids really going to thank their parents and thank their school when they've missed out on basic education and they realise the consequence of that in later life? I don't think so. And also, what about when these young people get a job and they're used to you just turn up when you feel like it, stay as long as you feel like it, and then just knock off if you get bored? How are they going to develop a work ethic? Anyway, let's move on to number two. So the next suggestion, lift the prohibition on children working. Now, years ago, kids used to work, and when they did, they could sometimes earn a fairly decent wage. And in some cases, that gave them the opportunity to leave home if they wanted to. Remember, we're talking about children here, not 17, 18-year-olds, uh, children, you know, 8-year-olds, 12-year-olds, whatever. So free to leave home and to make their own decisions, liberated from their parents' control. Now, if you look at the Marxist approach to these things, the Marxist approach to feminism is the only way women can be liberated is for them to be earning their own money. Otherwise, they're uh, oppressed. So the same thing applies to children. They need to be earning their own money for them to be free from control, for them to be liberated from oppression. Now, I'm sure lots of, uh, lots of kids, if they could work, didn't have to go to school, they might work a bit, earn some money, go to a theme park, earn some more money, go and do something else. This one. Meanwhile, their potential that could have been developed through education is being wasted. Again, there's a problem between what young people desire and what's in their best interest. Uh, it's often not the same thing. As they grow up, you try and make decisions for them that are in their best interest, help them to recognize for themselves what's in their best interest so they can begin to be making those decisions for themselves. But children are not that good at making those decisions. But Dr. Cook wants to give them the authority to make them in any case. So kids might think it's a great idea to get a job and earn some money to buy more PS4 games instead of going to school. But they'll lose out on their education and they could well end up uh, regretting it. If they leave the family home, they'll miss out on parental care and the nurturing relationships there. I think that would have a very negative developmental effect. All the evidence is that when family life is disrupted in some way, that harms the development of children. They would be vulnerable to all sorts of negative things outside the family home, outside the protection of living with adults. And just the very possibility of leaving home would change the relationship between parents and children. It's like within a marriage. I heard someone say once, within a marriage, never use the D word, never say divorce. As soon as that's been mentioned, then that's a factor in every argument. There's the implied threat that one or the other could walk away. That would make family relationships, parent-child relationships of the same type, that they would understand, the parents would understand that if they don't quite do what the kid wants, there's the possibility the kid can say, well, I'm going to get a job, move out, I'm going to live on their own. So who's vulnerable? Dr. Cook thinks that children are vulnerable when they're subject to parental control living in the family home. 
I think they're vulnerable if they're living in a flat on their own with no adults. But Dr. Cook thinks that could be liberating for children, while the family setting could be oppressive. Right, his third and final point was that children should be given a democratic vote. Now, obviously, very young children are not going to be able to do that. But the way he thought it should work could possibly be that if a child was capable of going online and registering to vote, then they got to vote. But imagine the potential for abuse for that. So dad could get the seven-year-old and say, come on, let's go and sit at the computer, get you registered, and then we'll go along and vote. I'll tell you who to vote for, and that would be that. The scope for corruption is enormous. We've already got votes for 16-year-olds, which hasn't generated a huge amount of controversy. But you can see why. Political parties really dare to oppose expansion of the franchise. If you say to a group, we actually don't think you should have had the vote here, then you're less likely to get those votes on you. So we often have, say, 16-year-olds coming up saying, we should have the vote because it's our future. Obviously, the same argument could be given by a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old, whatever. It's a weak argument, but it seems to be taken as all-conquering at the moment. Now, with younger children, votes for 16-year-olds, okay, maybe fair enough. But if you're going younger than that, then you're looking at people who really don't understand the issues by and large. They might have quite trivial priorities. They might take a very self-centered view of the political system. Now, you could say that's like lots of adults, and maybe it is, but you've got to draw the line somewhere. Same with driving, for example. Maybe some 16-year-olds would be more capable and more sensible drivers than some 18-year-olds, but you've got to draw the line somewhere. Same with voting age. So if children had the vote, imagine education policy issues. Imagine if a party put in no school on Fridays, no homework in years S1 and S2. Well, that's quite a large chunk of the electorate there. Uh, a lot more pupils than teachers will be voting, that's for sure. It's a similar sort of situation that we might end up with when prisoners are given the vote, because surely that's going to happen before too long. So in order to win the votes of prisoners, political parties will start putting into their manifesto changes to the prison system that will appeal to prisoners. Now, I think that's going to be pretty galling to quite a lot of the population. But the idea of political parties reaching into the family to communicate with children, I think, is distasteful. I think it could damage family unity. I think the way it's supposed to be in the family home with children is that the kids talk about politics with mum and dad and they learn a bit and they might disagree, they might agree, but it's, it's quite a, a relaxed process. But if it became a matter of influencing their vote by next Tuesday, that could spoil the family dynamic in some ways. Another issue with younger children voting is I wouldn't want children to be voting until they're well clear of the indoctrination that goes on in schools. If you had 14 year olds voting, they're in the thick of it at that point. Now, Dr. Cook said voting is one thing, but there's other ways their voices could be heard as well. For example, the children's parliament. Now I've talked about the children's parliament before, about the way it works basically is the government tells the schools to teach a politicized message. The schools teach it, the kids take it on board. And then when the government tries to listen to children, what they actually hear is their own message being reflected back to them. But this is the direction we're heading in, this democratization, this increasing emphasis on children's voices being heard. Now, democratizing schools is one thing, but also democratizing the family will also be an objective. So we'll head towards the stage, maybe we are already, whereas when Kitty goes to name person and says, I'll fall out with dad, dad says I'm not allowed to do this, but I want to do it. The name person, instead of saying, well, do as you're told, if that's what dad says, that's what you have to do, will be more likely to say, oh, we've got a problem here. Maybe I'll come in and mediate. I'll come and have a word with dad. Maybe we could set up a meeting and we can sort out a compromise. That's the direction things are heading in. Right, we're on to questions and answers then. One of my questions I asked to Dr. Cook was, listening to your language, it sounds quite Marxist in a lot of ways. Are you a Marxist? He replied by saying, I'm Marx curious. Now, anyone who can describe themselves as Marx curious without any shame or embarrassment is just incredible considering the destruction and damage wreaked by Marxism through the decades. But anyway, that was that. Uh, another person asked about the age of consent or the age of marriage, saying, Would you like to do away with those? And Dr. Cook said he hadn't really thought about that. And I said, Yeah, I don't blame you. 
because the inevitable conclusion from the logic that you're presenting would be probably the abolition of the age of consent, or at least lowering it very dramatically. Now, if we look at uh, Summer Hill School and A.S. Neal that Dr. Cook's commended to us already, let's see what he has to say on the subject. I personally believe that people should have a sex life when they want it, when they're ready for it. But you can't practice that in the school, and uh, not in this civilization anyhow. And our attitude to sex is simply, there's nothing sinful about sex, there's nothing evil about it. And uh, that's about all, and we don't give, give children any ideas that there's to be guilty about sex in any way. For example, one graduate recalled about time at Summerhill in the 1960s, it was common for students to get married in mock weddings, and they were allowed to sleep together. More worryingly, sexual relations between students and teachers were also common. Neil's 35-year-old stepson, Miles, who taught pottery, went out with some of the more senior pupils because he has a special dispensation. The normalisation and legalisation of sex with children and between children is on its way. I mean, the age of consent in Scotland is effectively 13 already. And as this children's rights equality agenda is pushed, that's going to push it down further. Right, the other thing I asked at the end of Dr. Cook's talk, I said, you've been talking about childhood. Most people, the first thing you think about with childhood is family, parents living in the family home. You made no mention of that at all. He wants children to be seen as mini-citizens, relating to employers and state the way adults do. He wants children to be liberated from parents. They're vulnerable and dependent, and that dependence is a bad thing while they're in the family home. They need to be able to break free from that. Now, if you've got this sort of agenda, if you say, I want to abolish childhood, you might be seen as a bit wacky, a bit of an extremist. But if you want to pursue the same agenda without being labelled an extremist, then don't call yourself someone campaigning, campaigning for the abolition of childhood. Call yourself a children's rights campaigner. Then you can push for all the same sort of things with a much more innocent facade. Now, if you call yourself a children's rights campaigner, people assume that you're just in favour of girls being able to go to school in Afghanistan. Whereas in actual fact, you can be campaigning for a pretty radical children's equality agenda. This whole topic reminds me of G.K. Chesterton's famous dictum, some ideas are so ridiculous that only an academic would believe them. I had a chat with Dr. Cook after the uh, evening. Uh, he was going to get in touch. I said we could maybe have a debate one day, uh, but he hasn't replied to emails. Now, one last thing. This talk about children being treated equally, no restrictions on what children are allowed to do. You could only go to it if you were age 12 and over. Right, thanks for watching. Do subscribe to us on YouTube. Have a look at our Facebook page. And we're a political party. You can consider joining us. There's a link below.